Okay, those of you still lingering in the foyer, please come in. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll, we'll move toward the final formal lecture of the day. And when we're through with this lecture, we'll then move gradually and informally into Vespers. So after the next lecture and any discussion that ensues from it, if you need to go anywhere, please do so and then we'll move into the final Vespers service. Um, before I invite Dr. Winger to give his lecture, I'll read out a final personal greeting. As you might expect, we invited Kay Tiffany, the founding secretary of the seminary, to be with us for the whole day. But Kay very much wanted to come but she's getting to the time in life when I suppose one is stricken in years and she felt she simply couldn't handle it, didn't feel up to it, but she very much w wants to be here and her heart is here and she sent a card for Dr. Winger which is sealed, so I don't know what she said in that, I'll give that to you, but she also sent a little letter. She says, today is a day of congratulations. Congratulations to you, Tom, and they are well deserved. I've known you for quite some time. Since the time you came to Concordia Seminary as Tom Winger's student, between that time and the present, you have acquired many titles, Reverend Doctor of Theology, President of Concordia Seminary, and perhaps other titles I may have overlooked, and now as published author also. Quite an accomplishment and deserving of congratulations. But I'm sure that you will say that all of those accomplishments would not be possible without God's blessings along the way. And you would be right, of course, because God has indeed blessed you richly. It's what you have done with those blessings and how you have received them that shows the kind of person you have become. You are a man of integrity, honesty, humble to a fault, and able to reach out and connect with people through the kindness of your heart, and most of all, showing God's love and your faith in all the blessings you have been given. I am sorry that I was unable to be present today, but I am here in spirit saying, congratulations, Reverend Dr. Tom Winger, on the occasion of the publication of the Ephesians commentary. It is a privilege and blessing to have you as a friend. God bless you always, Kate Tiffany. Now, three years ago, I think it was, Dr. Winger moved from acting to full president, and he had an ecclesiastical installation. But the transition wasn't really all that dramatic. It didn't change much of anything. And out of pure inadvertence, I think, the powers that be neglected to schedule an academic inauguration for him, which all the previous presidents had had. They'd had a day of lectures, they gave the concluding one, then there was a dinner. It was, maybe it was good for a couple of reasons uh, that, that we didn't have that inauguration back then. Number one, we were so severely in debt, we couldn't have afforded to give people a donut at Timmy's, I don't think, <laughs> at that time. And then, the way things have turned out with the publication of the Ephesians commentary, uh, well, 
it, it kind of goes through Dr. Winger to Paul, and Paul takes us back to Christ, and then Christ comes into the world as an emissary of the Father, and then, as Dr. Winger Senior said, it all becomes a soli deo gloria. So the whole thing is a soli deo gloria, but um, certainly, Tom, as your former teacher, as your friend, and now your subordinate colleague, I must say I find it an utter delight to work with you, under you, and um, I really rejoice in the leadership you give to the seminary and in these very, very difficult, troubling, trying times. We really wonder, how can we go ahead? Well, w w one of the gifts God does give us is your leadership. So please come up now and three years late, give your inaugural lecture as a well. <laughs> such a kind introduction, I'm almost afraid to point out that he missed the prefix in. Be before subordinates. But Well, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, when giving me some fatherly advice on the contents of my essay today, my senior colleague, Dr. Stevenson, backed up his words with the admonition, not everybody gets a conference dedicated to them, you know. <laughs> well, I didn't think we did eulogies in the Lutheran Church, but it seems that they're happening today and I'm not dead yet. I am truly humbled by this entirely outsized tribute and deeply thankful to the faculty, the staff, the board of the seminary, as well as to my colleagues, new and old, to my father, to my organist friend, Paul, all of whom have uh, contributed spectacularly today. And of course, to all of you uh, for coming to celebrate. But if this conference is a celebration of the release of Ephesians, it is with an entirely ulterior motive to draw attention to the scholarly work of the entire faculty of this seminary, to her graduates, one of whom spoke today and one who still will, and to the ministerium of our church with the goal of enticing men to aspire to the office of the ministry, as St. Paul called it, a very noble task, and to inspire lay people of all kinds to study God's holy word. And so by way of a conclusion to this festive day, and perhaps also as an inexcusably delayed inaugural address, I offer the following reflections on growing a seminary from New Testament seeds. If the seminary is a seedbed of the pastoral ministry, who is the gardener? Who decides what seeds are sown, how they're watered and fed, and how the plants are pruned, and what to do with the harvest? Who determines what's a weed and when to uproot it? A few decades ago, there were tiny ripples of a storm in the Missouri Synod teacup over whether seminary professors were teachers of the church or for the church. In exegetical terms, is it a subjective or objective genitive? Do they have a call to teach the church, or does the church tell them what to teach? Questions about who's the boss are rarely the best place to start, and usually arise in times of conflict. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could simply embrace both sides of the genitive, so that our theologians simply taught the church what the church first confessed? The church entrusts to the seminaries the task of creating a curriculum in line with that confession so as to produce the kind of pastures that God wants and she needs. But that curriculum doesn't arise in a vacuum. Five years ago, in preparation for this seminary's comprehensive accreditation visit, I researched the history of our curriculum, and I was intrigued by what I found. You'd probably be put to sleep, but I was intrigued. 
the original 1976 curriculum was inherited from our Fort Wayne mother, the Missouri Synod's so-called practical seminary. It was therefore heavy on practical theology, which comprised fully one-third of the MDiv, with courses like administration of parish education, pastoral psychology, crisis counseling, and Christian social ethics, a product of the times. Over the years, the mix was rebalanced a bit, but it seems that individual faculty members also stamped it with their own interests. A lengthy biblical interpretation course, cross-cultural ministry, hymnology, messianic prophecies, theological ethics, world religions. Some of you could probably name the men responsible. And in recent years, church conventions have petitioned the seminaries to beef up their teaching of present-day concerns like stewardship and creation. But who is the gardener, and who makes the plant grow? Ever more water and fertilizer may simply drown and poison the crop. Better pastures are not necessarily made by pumping in more information escalating from a garden hose to a fire hose to keep up with an era of information overload. It may be a very slight misapplication of the text, but Paul's words to the Corinthians offer an appropriate corrective. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. We may formulate mission statements for our seminary that set down what kind of servants we strive to develop. But what is always of crucial importance is whose servant is he? My predecessor in office, Dr. Jonathan Grothy, wrote a little gem that I read way back in 1988, entitled Reclaiming Patterns of Pastoral Ministry, Jesus and Paul. What would a seminary look like if we followed these New Testament patterns? It was 20 years ago, not quite today, that I had the rare and undeserved privilege of sharing the podium of our district pastors conference with my teacher, Norman Nagel. Typically, he handed out a ratty photocopy of a few articles from the Augsburg Confession on the Holy Ministry and lectured in his brilliant, contorted, and seemingly off-the-cuff manner. I followed nervously with a laborious essay on the office of the Holy Ministry according to the New Testament mandate of Christ. My plan was to take the kernel of an idea from Dr. Nagel and try to demonstrate it exegetically, the idea being that the four Gospels contain words of institution for the office of the ministry in a way parallel to classical thinking on the sacraments. For if the ministry was an order in the church that could only be traced to the apostles, then it might be considered optional or changeable, as indeed functionalists and proponents of women's ordination would contend. Mining the Book of Concord's various articles on the office of the ministry, I identified five key texts which I believed the Lutheran reformers had seen as containing Christ's institution. Matthew 16, 19 to 20, Matthew 28, 16 to 20, Mark 16, 15, Luke 10, 16, John 20, 21 to 23. Your wheels are turning. If these texts seem familiar, it's because we know them already as the institution texts for baptism and the office of the keys, as well as key texts mandating the apostles to preach the gospel to all creation. In other words, our 16th century confessional forefathers believed that when Christ instituted each means of grace, he simultaneously instituted the office by which that means would be administered. So the functions don't float about in abstract, but are to be carried out by real people put into office by Christ himself and representing him. In order to make this clear, the Book of Concord quotes one of those texts more than any other. The one who hears you is hearing me, and the one who rejects you is rejecting me, and the one who rejects me is rejecting the one who sent me. Luke 10, 16. This text, which reflects the Jewish rabbinical shaliach principle, sets forth the fundamental presupposition with which the Lutheran reformers approached the ministry. 
The word proclaimed by ministers is valid and effective not because of their power or character, but because of the promise of Christ that he will speak through them. Go to Apology 7 and 28 mainly. When the pastor faithfully speaks the word of Christ, even if he himself is impious, wicked, or unworthy, Christ himself is present through him to speak and to forgive. The ministry is about hearing Jesus. On that day two decades ago, I decided to put the Reformer's exegesis to the test by running through Matthew's Gospel to see how the pastoral office was woven through Jesus' ministry so that it culminated in the great mandate of Matthew 28. Along the way, I began to suspect that Matthew was distinctive among the Gospels, not in its theology of the ministry, but in its purpose. While it's commonly recognized that Matthew has a catechetical design, perhaps forming a new Pentateuch that begins with Jesus' teaching on a mountain and ends with his departure from a mountain, just like Moses, it seemed to me that Matthew was written with a particularly narrow focus on the twelve disciples as future ministers of Christ. To use a Lutheran distinction, or a Lutheran illustration, if Mark is the small catechism, the gospel of Christ in a nutshell as Peter preached it, Matthew is the large catechism, aimed at the preachers of that gospel. The content is essentially the same, but the audience is different. Matthew seems to be written to catechize the catechists, to teach the teachers to teach. And if this is true, then it opens a window on our Lord's own formation of the first ministers of his church. And before we can hear Paul, we must hear him. The Sermon on the Mount is a distinctive and beloved part of Matthew's Gospel, and I in no way wish to take it out of the hands of any Christian. But it seems to me that there are clear signs that we're listening in in our Lord's first seminary class. In distinction from Luke's somewhat parallel Sermon on the Plain in chapter 6, which addresses the crowds from the outset, Matthew in chapter 5 tells us that our Lord fled the crowds to teach his disciples alone. Now, the word disciple, mathetes, means nothing more than one who learns. But who these particular disciples were is given to us by the immediately preceding context. They are Peter and Andrew and James and John, four fishermen whose vocation was overturned by our Lord's call, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Thus began what would be a three-year journey with Christ from call to ordination and sending, as narrated in Matthew's Gospel. Jesus promises them that if they follow him, he will make them fishers of men, future tense. They don't materialize as fully formed preachers, as some of our first-year seminarians might think, (laughs) as if willingness alone could qualify them for the job but he would form them. And it began with following Jesus, being in his company as he taught, preached, and healed every kind of disease. And then he sat them down on a mountain, away from the crowds, for their introduction to theology course. He begins with a series of Beatitudes in the third person. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. He proclaims the gospel in general terms. Those who are poor and weak and hungry and thirsty will be given a gracious recompense in the messianic kingdom. But then his language shifts to the second person plural. It is as if Jesus turns his attention away from the distant crowds to whom the gospel would be proclaimed to speak pointedly to the fledgling proclaimers. Blessed are you when they revile you and persecute you and say every evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for thus they pro- persecuted the prophets who were before you. Matthew 5, 11 to 12. Note, not the people of God who were before you, but the prophets who were before you. Jesus is speaking to the disciples as the prophets of a new era, warning them that their vocation as fishers of men will not be an easy one. 
but it is a vital calling, as he goes on to say, for they will be the light of the world, shining the lamp of God's word on behalf of him who was the true light that came into the world. But what kind of word would they proclaim? If the Sermon on the Mount is the first seminary class, it begins with the distinction between law and gospel. Is the Old Testament to be abandoned as a word of law no longer applicable to God's people? No, Jesus says, for he did not come to abolish the Torah and the prophets, but to fulfill them. It was crucial for the disciples to understand this, for the would-be teachers of Israel, the Pharisees, taught the Torah as a book of law by which men could hope to achieve righteousness before God. But Jesus says, far from relaxing the precepts of the law or setting aside the teachings of the Torah, his disciples were to do and to teach them in such a way that their righteousness, the righteousness that they did and taught, would far exceed that of the Pharisees. Teaching his disciples to preach, Jesus then unfolds the true way of the Torah. As law, it cannot be tamed. Just when you think you've got it under control, the law comes back and bites you. You may think you've obeyed the fifth commandment, but if you get angry with your brother, then you've committed murder in your heart. Thus, the disciples are taught to preach the law in such a way as to avoid self-righteousness and to lead people towards Jesus. And so the sermon proceeds. He wraps up his discourse on the Decalogue by putting our relationship to the law in proper theological perspective, using the future tense as the strongest of imperatives. Therefore, you shall be perfect, just as your heavenly Father is perfect. He then continues to distinguish the disciples from the Pharisees by giving them a new way to practice the traditional threefold piety of almsgiving, prayer, and fasting. He warns them against the love of money and encourages them to trust the Lord to provide for them, words that will be echoed soon after as he sends them out on their first preaching mission in chapter 10. He warns them against hypocrisy in applying the law to others, exhorting them first to deal with the log in their own eye. And he admonishes them not to give what is holy to dogs or pearls to swine a proverb with particular meaning for ministers of the gospel. But now the crowds have found Jesus and are creeping into the periphery of the sermon, and Jesus starts to preach beyond the disciples to all who would hear, and when he was finished with his teaching, by the end of chapter 7, the crowds were completely astonished. Thinking of the Sermon on the Mount as an inaugural lecture, a seminary class, may leave us a little cold. As the warning about the log in the eye reminds us, Jesus wasn't simply imparting information about the law, but was first preaching it directly into his disciples' own hearts. Now, there certainly was knowledge he needed to instill. We see this most clearly when he takes the disciples aside in private to explain his parables, as he does in excruciating detail with the parable of the sower, for example. On the one hand, he says, there's a kind of spiritual game of hide-and-seek going on. Jesus speaks in parables to the crowds to hide from them what they're not yet ready to know apart from faith. But to the believers on the inside, he explains the parables so that their faith is deepened. He says, to you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For to the one who has, more will be given, but from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. But as Jesus proceeds to explain the parable of the sower, it seems that he's giving the disciples an even deeper insight, not only into his own ministry to Israel, but also into their ministry that will follow. He's teaching them to understand how and why their proclamation will only rarely bear fruit, even as the prophets of old suffered to have their message rejected. But because these disciples know Jesus, they are blessed with an even greater insight than the prophets of old. 
So there is knowledge to impart, knowledge about Jesus. But Jesus' relationship to the disciples is much more personal than that. When he takes his disciples with him on his missions of healing and exorcism, we're tempted perhaps to view it through the prism of pedagogy, as if it were a seminary fieldwork exercise, like following a pastor around on his hospital visits. This is how it's done. Go and do likewise. But with Jesus, something greater is happening. When he heals the ruler's daughter, he puts the crowds outside and keeps only the disciples with him. But although Jesus later gives the disciples themselves the authority to heal diseases and even raise the dead, one never gets the impression that they're at his side just to learn a technique. They are his witnesses. They watch him raise the dead so that their puny faith would be strengthened to believe that he is truly the Holy One of Israel. And they watch him so that they can be his witnesses to testify to Israel and to the Gentiles to the truthfulness of the gospel. The capstone of that testimony was the confession that this Jesus was no ordinary man, but truly the Son of God. Jesus led them towards this confession by demonstrating his divine power over wind and waves, as in the boat on the Sea of Galilee. What sort of man is he that even the winds and the seas obey him, they ask. Funnily enough, the demons get to the conclusion first, proclaiming before they're cast out into the swine that Jesus is the Son of God. But Peter gets there eventually at Caesarea Philippi, where at the conclusion of the middle section of Matthew's Gospel, just prior to the transfiguration and passion, he finally confesses, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. A confession recognized by the treatise in the Book of Concord, not simply as a personal creed, but as the core act of the office of the Holy Ministry. It is on this Predigtamt, this office of preaching that Christ was, would build his church. And so Jesus replies to Peter that he will give him the keys to the kingdom of heaven, a promise brought to fruition on Easter Eve in John 20. Jesus forms them as his ministers by showing them who he is and leading them to confess him as the Son of God. Jesus teaches his disciples Christology by performing miracles that testify to his divinity. But as he makes clear when he heals the paralytic in Capernaum, the greater divine miracle is to forgive sins. When Jesus sees the faith of the paralytic and the men who brought him, by the way, he immediately proclaims that the man's sins are forgiven. This causes great consternation among the scribes, who know that only God has the authority to forgive sins and therefore accuse Jesus of blasphemy. Jesus trumps this charge by proving that he is indeed divine. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sin, he then said to the paralytic, rise, pick up your, be your bed, and go home. When the crowd saw it, they were afraid, and they glorified God, who had given such authority to men. Authority is a key concern of Matthew's Gospel. It has come up in the previous chapter in Jesus' dealings with the centurion, seeking healing for his servant, Matthew 8, who says, Lord, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof, but only say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I too am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he marveled. What's Matthew getting at with these closely connected stories about authority? A clue may be found in the final sentence I read a moment ago from Capernaum, they glorified God who had given such authority to men, plural. This isn't simply about Jesus, but about those on whom he would confer his authority. By his own words and actions, even by the testimony of others, 
Jesus teaches his disciples what it means to wield God's authority. This conclusion is suggested by the placement of the account of Matthew's own call immediately after these words in Matthew 9. But it becomes explicit in the next chapter when Jesus confers authority on his disciples and sends them out on their first mission, of which more anon. And towards the end of the gospel, when the mother of the sons of thunder seeks for James and John thrones on Jesus' right and left hand in his kingdom, Jesus is prompted to teach the disciples the spirit in which they're to wield any kind of authority that he might give them. He says, Matthew 20, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones tyrannize over them. It shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. They are to be servant-like and Christ-like in their exercise of authority, because the authority they wield is Christ's authority. This is the way he expresses it at the conclusion of the Gospel. All authority in heaven on earth has been given to me, therefore you go make disciples of all nations. Now finally, since they have watched the Messiah suffer, die, and rise again, Finally, they're ready to receive and use his authority rightly. But let's go back to Matthew's call for a moment. To what was he called? To follow Jesus, obviously, but what does that entail? The very next sentence in Matthew 9 describes the experience. And it happened that as Jesus was reclining at table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with Jesus and his disciples. The verb anakemai, to recline, usually under-translated in our Bibles as sat at table, implies that Jesus was not simply eating with these sinners, but feasting with them, as the posture of lying down to eat was a sign of unfettered leisure. The disciples of the ascetic John the Baptist noticed the significance of this body language when they asked in the very next paragraph, why the Pharisees fast, but Jesus' disciples feast. To this, Jesus replies that he, the bridegroom, is present with his wedding guests. The time for fasting will come when he's withdrawn from them. The implication is that Jesus is giving his disciples a foretaste of the feast to come. They're experiencing heaven on earth. Far from getting a simple lesson in hospitality to sinners, these future ministers of the gospel are given a glimpse of the heavenly goal towards which they will be leading his people. They are formed by feasting with Jesus. He gives them the same experience when he leads them through the fields on the Sabbath and allows them to glean wheat and eat it in his presence. In this way, the Sabbath is shown not simply to be abolished in Christ, but rather to be fulfilled. The true mark of the Messianic age is to rest and to eat with Jesus. In a far more dramatic fashion, Jesus demonstrates this by feeding the 5,000 in the wilderness. The pastoral character of that story is indicated firstly by Jesus' instruction to the disciples you give them something to eat, an injunction they're unable to carry out by their own power. Only when Jesus multiplies the bread and fish are they able to carry his gifts to the people. Here again, they're taught the significance of their coming ministry, to give out divine food as servants of Jesus. Of course, the significance of reclining at table with Jesus becomes most clear when our Lord once again in the more intimate setting of the upper room, takes bread to break it. Here, finally, Matthew reveals where all previous meals with Jesus were leading, as Jesus connects this meal with his death, gives his precious body and blood into their mouths, and solemnly informs them that he will not eat it with them again until he comes into his kingdom, a reference which, I think, 
is to his return on the last day, the coming of the bridegroom that puts an end to all fasting. Jesus' call to discipleship, the call to follow him, is always accompanied in Matthew's Gospel by the sober realization that this time of fasting will be hard. Following Jesus means carrying the cross, suffering and dying with him. But beyond the universal significance of that somber warning for all who would follow him, Matthew's Gospel focuses its beam on the hard and narrow path that lies especially before those who would be Jesus' ministers. The scribe who leaps at the chance to follow Jesus is warned that as the Son of Man has no place to lay his head, so will his ministers be housed less comfortably than even foxes of the ground and birds of the air. Anyone want to agree with that? Right. In contrast to this eager beaver, the next would-be disciple wants to linger over his family and bury his father before committing himself to Jesus' path. The contrasting echoes of Elisha's call are faintly discernible, for there was a prophet who willingly and rapidly bade farewell to his family, broke the yoke and boiled the oxen so that there was no looking back as he set off behind Elijah. Jesus' ministers must be at least as willing to set their master above their former vocations. This is the nature, likewise, of the four fishermen's call to drop their nets and Matthew's call to abandon his tax booth. This isn't merely a figurative depiction of the call to faith for people who would not literally abandon their families to follow Jesus, but a rather literal picture of the single-minded sacrificial vocation to which his ministers are called. These early chapters of the Gospel culminate in the great mission of Matthew 10, which is introduced by these words at the end of chapter 9, which were last year's seminary theme. When Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion on them, because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Chapter 10 then calls these laborers apostles, the first and only occurrence of the term in Matthew's Gospel. These twelve are Jesus' sent ones, as the word apostles means, going forth to continue Jesus' own mission to Israel, and by chapter 28, even to all the Gentiles. But we shouldn't assume, since apostle is not Matthew's favored term for the twelve as it is for Luke, we shouldn't assume that Matthew has less interest in them as apostles, as preachers of the kingdom. By concentrating on the term disciple, Matthew focuses on the, on the Twelve's relationship with Jesus, his teaching and forming them to be his apostles. Matthew introduces the term apostle here only briefly to give us a glimpse of the mission that Jesus has in store for them when they're ready, a foretaste of the ongoing apostolic mission which he commits to them in Matthew 28. Here in Matthew 10, Jesus grants them a temporary authority to be his instruments in casting out demons, healing diseases, and preaching the coming kingdom throughout Israel. Again, he warns them that they will suffer as he suffers, preaching without pay, accepted by some but rejected by many. And he warns them that God has in store a Sodom and Gomorrah-like punishment for those villages that reject them. As he does so, he prepares the way for his summative statement on the nature of the ministry to which they're called. The one who receives you receives me, and the one who receives me receives the one who sent me. Matthew 10, 41. Here Jesus refers to his own mission from the Father using the verb apostello, to send, the verb that lies at the root of the word apostle. Just as he is God the Father's apostle to the world, so the twelve are his apostles. Jesus continues his mission through them 
And in this way, as he promises at the gospel's end, he will be with us until the close of the age. Once again, we're tempted to view the training of Jesus' disciples in purely pragmatic terms. I myself have occasionally compared the short-term mission of Matthew 10 to our seminary tradition, dating back only to 1932, by the way, of sending out students on a one-year vicarage or internship. We think of this vicarage as the chief practicum in their training, an intensive time of shadowing an experienced practitioner and practicing their preaching, teaching, and visitation under supervision. But the Twelve weren't on vicarage. They weren't learning techniques from Jesus. They were being conformed to him. They were experiencing the power of his word and mandate. They were learning the truth of his claims to have power over sin, death, and demons, and becoming firm in the confidence that Jesus could, keep, could give this authority to men. Soon, as his ominous warning about their coming time of fasting had intimated, Jesus would be taken away from them visibly and they would need to rely on his word of promise alone. Thus, we shouldn't be surprised that as his death approaches, Jesus withdraws steadily from the crowds, draws his disciples close to him, and begins to prepare them for what is coming. Here we see Jesus lamenting that Jerusalem has ever killed the prophets and stoned those sent to it in Matthew 23. Jesus then takes the disciples aside privately on the Mount of Olives for his final words in chapter 24. He warns them that the temple will be destroyed to punish Jerusalem for rejecting him, and he proceeds to unfold the signs of the coming judgment. And at the close of the discourse, he tells three successive parables that are directed specifically to the imminent moment when the disciples will begin to carry out their ministry. Who then, he says, who then is the faithful and wise servant whom his master has set over his household to give them their food at the proper time? Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. The image of Christ's minister as a trusted servant put in charge of God's household is one we will soon see in 1 Timothy. Here in Matthew, it's critical again to note that this parable does not appear to be directed at all Christians. Rather, Jesus is giving a solemn charge to the Twelve to care for his household until he returns, fiercely warning them that the returning master will deal ruthlessly with any servant who's found abusing the members of the household rather than feeding them. A very contemporary warning, I think. The next parable concerning the ten virgins should, I think, be read on the heels of what preceded. The image is the same, but rather than a returning master, we now have a bridegroom. We await Jeff Gibbs' third volume to lay out the manifold ways that the virgins and their lamps have been interpreted through the ages. The crude Reformation dichotomy is that the papists saw the oil and the lamps as the good work of the saints, by which they would gain entry into the eternal feast, or lacking them be barred. Luther characteristically turned the table by identifying the oil with faith. But at the risk of disagreeing with an icon, neither <laughs> interpretation seems to me to do justice to, the standard, to standard New Testament imagery or to the context of the parable. For, on the one hand, in every New Testament example I can think of, the bride is the image of the church, the bridegroom is Christ, and the wedding banquet is the eternal heavenly feast to which he brings us. In the parable of the ten virgins, the bride, that is the church, is actually a peripheral figure not actually mentioned in the story. The ten virgins are the attendants on the bride, the ones who get her ready for the coming of her beloved. They do so by holding forth the light of their lamps, a consistent biblical image for the word of God. As Christ first proclaims to his newly called disciples, you are the light of the world, so their mandate was not to hide that light or let it go out 
but to continue shining it to the church until Christ returned. Thus, reading this parable in its context, we must surely understand the ten virgins to represent the apostles who were mandated to hold forth the word of God to the bride faithfully, with the stunning warning that if they forsook this calling, if they abandoned his word, letting their lamps go out, their own place in the heavenly kingdom would be forfeit. Time doesn't permit us to, dev to devote a great deal of attention to the next parable, that of the talents, but reading it in line with what preceded, we're surely encouraged to view the three servants entrusted with their master's goods until he returns as figures of the apostles. Like the oil in the lamps, the talents to be used for the growth of the master's fortune surely represent the word of God. All the master demands of them is faithfulness, not results. As in the parable of the sower, the proclaimer of the word can only scatter it, invest it in the kingdom, and leave the growth to the Lord. The servant who earns five talents is rewarded no more richly than the one who earns two, but the servant who refused to put his master's goods to work, burying the talents in the ground, is condemned and excluded from the kingdom. Thus, Jesus, in three parallel parables, gives his final mandate to the disciples to care for his people with the goods he has entrusted to them, and warns them fiercely of the dangers of unfaithfulness. If we wish to grow a seminary from New Testament seeds, we have much to learn from Matthew's Gospel. We've seen on the one hand that these 12 men of middling intelligence and middle-class upbringing needed some knowledge for their task. Jesus carefully walked them through the Old Testament to show how it pointed to him as the Messiah. He taught them the right relationship of law and gospel, a righteousness that far exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees. Jesus demonstrated the right use of authority, a selfless, sacrificial service that eschewed domineering and glory. And he taught them to use that authority to forgive sins as he had done and in his name, promising that he would back up their words with divine power. He showed them a path of self-sacrifice and suffering in which they, as disciples, would certainly not be above their master. But, on the other hand, his three-year formation of the apostles was about more than knowledge. Certainly they needed to learn that he was the divine Messiah, the Son of God, with power over wind and waves, demon and death, but more importantly they needed to know him and to be known by him. What we see is an ever-deepening relationship being formed between these men. Jesus conceals himself from the crowds and reveals himself to the disciples. He shows them mercy and eats with them, showing them what their relationship will be like, even after his resurrection and ascension, as he takes bread and wine and says, this is my body, this is my blood, and continues, to eat with them. My aforementioned predecessor in office always bristles when we speak of training ministers, as if we were dealing with dogs or dolphins jumping through hoops. The pastoral office is not simply a collection of skills, though skills are certainly required. As Jesus formed these 12 Galileans into his apostles by being with them, speaking with them, praying with them, and eating with them. So we also seek to mold servants for the kingdom, both inside the classroom and without. Hence my annual speech to the students about the centrality of this chapel in their pastoral formation. Unless they're drawn closer to Jesus by listening to his word, submitting their will to his will, and being united to him by his body and his blood, then their knowledge and skills will be in vain, disconnected from the one who gives them life. So also we form men into pastors by being pastors to them. This is why we call only ordained Lutheran pastors to teach here. This is what makes a seminary distinct from a university department of theology. The classroom is my pulpit, my Westfield colleague Glenn Sweck used to remark. But it is also true that the pulpit is our pulpit, and we stand at the altar both with and in front of our students. 
The way of the ancient church was for young men aspiring to the ministry to work their way up through the orders at the right hand of their teaching bishop and in his church. Our seminaries are as close as we come today to this model, which finds its roots both in Jesus and in Paul. Today's conference is dedicated to Paul, especially his relationship with Timothy, his true child in the faith. Thus far, I've kept my distance from Paul. Someone has remarked that with nearly a thousand pages, I've already said enough. <laughs> Brother Hamp has already exhaustively and beautifully pictured that apostolic relationship. At the same time, it's also true that while Paul has written much to Timothy about what a pastor should look like, we know very little about how Paul formed Timothy himself. But as we close our consideration of pastoral formation on the basis of the New Testament, it's certainly worth teasing out a few clues that suggest Paul closely followed our Lord's own example. A quick biography. It was on Paul's second missionary journey that he ran across young Timothy at Lystra, the son of a Jewish Christian mother and a Greek father. He was well spoken of by the brethren and commended to Paul. And Paul, quote, wanted this one, synauto exelthane, to go out with him. That sounds a little funny. The ESV translates to accompany him. Um, the idea is that Timothy would follow Paul. When Paul arrives in Thessalonica in the next chapter of Acts, Silas is listed as his senior partner. When Paul is driven out of neighboring Berea, Timothy is left behind with Silas to be his junior, as he again appears to be when Silas and Timothy, in that order, travel from Macedonia to meet Paul in Corinth. It is no surprise, then, that in two letters from Paul to the Thessalonians, Timothy is listed in third place after Paul and Silas. Timothy absorbs the office at Paul's left hand and Silas is right. But as time passes, things begin to change. While Paul is in Ephesus on his third journey, he sent, quote, Timothy and Erastus to Macedonia, Acts 19. Note the advancement in order. In 1 Corinthians, Timothy is Paul's trusted ambassador to sort out the most troublesome congregation of his ministry. He then appears alongside Paul as the co-author of 2 Corinthians, named as his brother. When Paul is driven out of Ephesus by the riot, Acts 20, verse 1, he leaves Timothy behind to sort out the mess. In my mind, the logical setting for 1 Timothy. By the time Paul writes Romans from Corinth at the end of his third missionary journey, Timothy has reached the elevated status of my co-worker, Hoss in Ergosmu. Finally, Timothy accompanies Paul back to Jerusalem and into his captivity, featuring then as the co-author of Colossians, Philemon, and Philippians, while continuing to be Paul's ambassador to places from which his imprisonment restrained him. Paul wishes to send him from Rome to Philippi, and then calls him back to his side in his final incarceration, 2 Timothy 4, verse 9. In that final testament, Paul instructs Timothy to bring the cloak, the scrolls, and the books. Perhaps this seeming triviality should be read against the story of Elijah and Elisha as indicating that Paul will soon be passing the mantle to his successor. What can we say about how Paul formed Timothy as a minister? We learn nothing from Acts about any classroom instruction in theology that Paul likely gave Timothy, I don't doubt it. But what we do see is the same master-disciple relationship that characterized Jesus and the Twelve. Paul calls Timothy to follow after him, and step by step he molds him into imitation of his office. He entrusts authority to him slowly and confers full authority only with the laying on of his hands when Timothy is ready, 2 Timothy 1.6. Along the way, Timothy grows from commended brother to co-worker of Paul to my true child in the faith. Paul forms him into a faithful minister 
by personal contact in a father-son relationship. No wonder then that when Paul gives Timothy instruction on the kind of man who is suited to the office, in the famous words of 1 Timothy 3 that Pastor Hamp read to us earlier, the familial image is paramount. He is to be the husband of one wife. And after listing a series of important personal qualities, Paul returns emphatically to this paternal image, presiding well over his own household, having his children in submission with all dignity. For if someone does not know how to preside over his own household, how will he care for God's church? So where did Paul get the idea that the minister is to preside over the church as over a household? From our Lord himself, who entrusted his stewards with all that he had committed to them, giving to them the keys to open the very treasuries of heaven, so that until he returned, they might feed God's children with the riches of his storehouse. And so may we all be found faithful in that same task until he returns. Again, as I said at the beginning, I, I will take your thanks and your recognition on behalf of everyone here and the entire faculty. As Pastor Reinhardt is getting ready, would Anyone care to ask any questions? Or, Dr. Stevenson, you're in charge, so I hesitate to invite it.